straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. It's Twitter versus Elon Musk. The social media giant and SpaceX inventor will face off in a coming trial. And I grieve for these senseless killings, and I ache for the scars that are left behind on the victims and on our community. Officials identify everyone involved in a mass shooting at an Indiana shopping mall that left four dead, including the gunman. But first, the first witnesses are called in the Parkland School Massacre trial. We were um, just sitting, kind of like sitting ducks. Um, we had no way to protect ourselves, no way to stand up for ourselves. Survivors and family members of victims are called to testify. I saw his body, not spasming, but more like trying to take his like final breaths. Um, and then at that moment, you know, it started getting more real. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. Florida juries hear from survivors of the Parkland School shooting on day two of the gunman's penalty phase trial. 17 people were killed and 17 more injured when a then 19-year-old gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. In October of last year, the shooter pled guilty to 17 counts of murder and 17 more counts of attempted murder, which prompted his case to head straight into the penalty phase. In what's expected to be a months-long case, a jury will decide whether the shooter is sentenced to life in prison or given the death penalty. On Tuesday, jurors heard from me family members of victims and survivors of the shooting. Alexander Dorette was both, as he was shot by the gunman and survived, but his brother was shot and killed. While I was sitting there, you know, just trying not to think this is real, thinking it's, you know, fake, um, you know, and then just not trying to process, you know, what's going on. And then um, while I'm sitting there, you know, I have a couple of people around me that are just, you know, trying also not to, you know, freak out. And uh, then I remember feeling trickling down the back of my head and onto my chest. And then, you know, I touched the back of my head and then my hand was all bloody. I saw um, Alex Shackner passed away uh, over his desk, kind of like half of his body. There was like a metal bar on the desk and half of his body was off the bar and the other half was like still kind of in his seat. And uh, I saw a pile of blood like forming under him and I saw his body not spasming, but more like trying to take his like final breaths. Um, and then at that moment, you know, it started getting more real. Joining us today is legal analyst Joe Richardson and co-host Terry Austin. Joe, photos of the massacre, even our producers had, had commented on this, were supposedly so graphic, people in the court had to leave, but the jury must stay and see it all. What kind of impact will that have on their decision? It's going to have an incredible impact. Um, you add the, the, the photos along with the testimony that is very precise. People remember dates, times. They're really taking you back to the moment, the, what happened. And it comes together like a puzzle to really color this incident. Mm -hmm. And so the photos are incredibly, incredibly graphic. But the soundtrack of the photos are the, uh, is the testimony of the individuals. And based on that, when you put that all together, it has a, a devastating impact on this defendant's prospects. We'll see what they say, but the impact is there's no there's no doubt that it's incredible. Yeah. Now, now that's going to be compiled because, Terry, some of the testimony from the victims, well, I don't want to say redundant because of the connotation, but very similar, as there are many victims. Do you think that similarity between these testimonies is going to hurt the prosecution's case? I don't think it's going to hurt them in this case. The first thing is you don't want to alienate the jury, but this is important testimony. There are 17 people who died, 17 people who were injured. Each of them has a unique experience, and it's important to tell that story. It's really important for the families to be able to listen to what's going on, making sure that that story has been told. The judge has already limited certain pieces of evidence. So, for instance, she hasn't allowed duplicity as far as photos are concerned, maybe two, three per victim, but she is limiting some of that. So I think that will help. Yeah. And of course, the guilt phase is done and the penalty phase is both about finding the right number, but also a sense of catharsis for the victims and the victim's family. So it makes sense that there may be some similarities because everyone's got to be heard.
An update now on the deadly Oxford High School shooting. Several news sources report the school district officials who met with the accused shooter before the massacre were quietly placed on leave. Four people were killed and seven more injured when a gunman opened fire in the high school last November. A then 15-year-old suspect was taken into custody. He now faces 24 charges, including murder and terrorism. He's being tried as an adult. His parents, Jennifer and James Crumbly, are also charged with involuntary manslaughter. Multiple news sources now report that the district's dean of students and school counselor met with the suspect before the shooting spree and were later placed on non-disciplinary administrative leave. The Detroit News reports the faculty members were placed on leave for one month following the shooting. Two civil lawsuits have been filed against the school district for negligence. A judge recently ruled surveillance video from the shooting would be released. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, our coverage continues in the Parkland School Shooter's Penalty Phase trial. Still ahead, hear the gripping testimony from one of the prosecution's first witnesses. Welcome back. Continuing our coverage of the Parkland School Shooter Penalty Phase trial, after opening statements were presented Monday, one of the first prosecution witnesses to testify was a student who survived the massacre. She described what happened when gunshots rang out. Tell us what happens after you go uh, near Ms. Riovan's desk. So uh, then we go over to the other side of the classroom by her desk, um, and at this time he still hadn't shot into our classroom at that point. We were um, just sitting, kind of like sitting ducks. Um, we had no way to protect ourselves, no way to stand up for ourselves. And um, once we were all kind of in over by the um, door and away from the door, that's when he had shot into our classroom. Um, he injured four people in my classroom, uh, one of them um, being fatal. Um, and from there, we just kind of sat and waited until the police came and took us out of the classroom. And did you do anything to record what was, what was occurring? Yes. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but my initial instinct was to pick up my phone and start recording. Um, and so I did. I took several videos of what was happening. One of those videos was shown in court. Members of the gallery and the witnesses broke down in tears as it played. We will only play the audio, but we do want to warn you the following clip could be disturbing to some viewers. I'm sorry, unfortunately, I'm hearing this for the first time like many of our viewers are. Um, but Terry, what was the most powerful piece of testimony that you think will decide the Parkland shooter's life or fate based on what you're seeing and hearing now? Well, I definitely think that that tape will be part of the testimony that will move these jurors. Listening and watching those people getting shot and killed before their very eyes, I think, is going to help dictate what should happen to the defendant here. It's definitely cold. It's calculated. We know from the videotape he did before the incident that it was premeditated. He said he wanted to do this. So I definitely think that the videos in this case are going to help that jury decide whether or not the defendant here serves life in prison without parole or whether or not he gets the death sentence. It is a horrible, heinous, atrocious crime, which is one of the aggravating factors. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to talk about this as a lawyer, uh, especially when many of us are, are parents or myself expecting to be a parent. But Joe, um, we're just starting. 
but with this testimony and the audio recording, do you think the jurors will have already made up their mind before the defense even does their opening because they plan to do it when the prosecution's case is over? They took a chance by not saying, at the very least, at the beginning, hey, listen, we want you to stay focused. We're not saying that he didn't do it. We're not saying he's not responsible for it. But keep an open mind or making some kind of presentation at the beginning. They took a chance in doing that. And the chance that they take is that we may be so far down the road of aggregating factors, aggravating factors, that their attempts at presentation on mitigation doesn't work. So uh, the, you would like to think they haven't made up their mind. but. Thus far, the prosecution is the only side doing an uh, presentation. And so, therefore, uh, you know, the defense is certainly going to be in trouble any way you look at it. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'm a public defender in Brooklyn from Canada, probably the most liberal person you've seen on this show. But even my, and I don't support the death penalty, even my mind is kind of, but we'll see how this case continues. Switching now to celebrity news, four decades after he fled the country as a fugitive, Roman Polanski's attorneys say they're pushing for the director to be sentenced in a 1977 sexual assault case. Newly unsealed documents show a California judge indicated he would go back on a promise not to jail Polanski. The documents that feature testimony from a prosecutor made in 2010 explain that the judge planned to break his promise to free Polanski. This led to the director fleeing the country in 1978 and becoming a fugitive. In 1977, a then 13-year-old girl claimed Polanski sexually assaulted her while the pair were at Jack Nicholson's home. She said Polanski gave her a sedative, then forced her to have sex. The girl later refused to testify in court, and Polanski pled guilty to unlawful sex with a minor. Polanski's attorneys say the unsealed testimony points to conduct and requests a new judge on the case outside of Los Angeles County. The director's defense also argues that under COVID-19 protocol, Polanski should be able to appear via Zoom from France instead of in person in the United States. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the shooters identified after a mass shooting at an Indiana mall. Plus, Elon Musk and Twitter, Twitter go head-to-head -head in court. Could their lawsuit soon be headed to trial? Welcome back. Attorneys for social media giant Twitter and billionaire Elon Musk face off in court for the first time. As a judge rules, a five-day trial will be set for October. This comes after Twitter filed suit against the Tesla CEO when Musk announced he was backing out of a deal to purchase a social media platform. Musk made the move in April to purchase Twitter for $44 billion, saying the site was limiting free speech. He said he wanted to take the company private, arguing he would be able to grow Twitter and make it more politically neutral. Musk and his lawyers say he's decided to back out of the deal, accusing Twitter of withholding information about the number of spam and bot accounts on the platform. In the merger, Twitter and Musk had agreed either would pay a $1 billion breakup fee if they were responsible for the deal falling through. Attorneys for Twitter motioned to expedite the legal process, requesting a four-day trial in September. Musk's team opposed the motion, pushing for a winter 2023 court date. On Tuesday, a Delaware judge ruled in favor of Twitter, setting aside five days in October of this year for the trial. Terry, Musk has a number of arguments, but let's focus on the bots. He knew there were bots, maybe not the number, but he knew they were there. He even sold himself as the one that could solve the problem. So why and how is he backing out of the deal because of these bots? He's basically saying, yes, he knew about the bots, but he did not know it was so many as far as that platform was concerned. And so he was misled. He's trying to say that Twitter was hiding something. Now, I don't think it's the strongest argument. I think the same argument could say for spam, for instance, that he knew there was spam, but he's saying he did not know there was as much spam as there was. So it's more of a reliance argument than anything else. And I think at this point, based on what I've heard, he's not going to prevail. Yeah. Joe, what do you think the goal is for Twitter? To actually have Musk run the company or strike a deal so this merger doesn't hurt the company and they make a little bit of cash? And in an irony, uh, he, uh, you know, offered all this money, you know, $20 per share more than the company is actually worth. But he's a door number one. You know, what's behind door number one? Who's behind door number one? Where would it actually take the company? I bet that, that they're up in the air about that. 
And on some level, it may be just as good for them to get the billion dollars, uh, you know, uh, for him breaking up the deal uh, and still, you know, solidifying itself a bit more and then going along its way and being in a situation that's a little bit less risky. I mean, if I can make a billion dollars because of a breakup, I would. Makes sense. We'll see how it continues. A veteran Hollywood producer known for his work on the sitcom Scrubs is arrested in connection to a series of sexual assaults. Eric Weinberg was arrested last week for what investigators say was targeted behavior. They say he scoped out women in their 20s and 30s while at public places like a coffee shop or a grocery store. He then pretended to be a photographer and invited the women to his home for a photo shoot. After that, he would sexually assault them. Officials with the Los Angeles Police Department say they are seeking to identify additional victims, saying Weinberg's scheme dates back to the early 1990s. Weinberg was also booked for sexual assault charges in 2012 and 2019. For his latest arrest, Weinberg is being held on more than $3 million bail. When we come back, the deadly Indiana Mall shooting. What we know right now about the gunman and the victims involved. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. The defendant chooses not to testify ahead of closing arguments in a Colorado double homicide trial as Kevin Dean Eastman faces murder charges in the deaths of his ex-girlfriend and her new love interest. Eastman is charged with two counts of first-degree murder, tampering with a deceased human body, and tampering with physical evidence for allegedly killing Heather Frank and local musician Stanley Scott Sessions on separate days in February of 2020. Frank and Eastman both had arrest warrants in connection to Sessions' murder before Frank's body was found. Prosecutors say Eastman slit Sessions' throat inside Frank's apartment and that Eastman fatally shot Frank in the chest twice to silence the only witness to Sessions' killing. They say he then hid her body near a burn pile on the property of his new employer. Investigators say Eastman burned Sessions' body and was allegedly preparing to burn Frank's body when he was arrested at a nearby gas station. The defense rested its case Monday shortly after the defendant told the judge he wouldn't be testifying. Here closing arguments from both the prosecution and the defense ahead of the case being handed off to the jury on the next episode of Law & Crime Daily. And in Indiana, officials have identified those involved in a shooting at an Indianapolis area shopping mall. It happened on Sunday evening in Greenwood, Indiana, at Greenwood Park Mall. Three people were killed after a 20-year-old shooter entered the mall with two rifles, a handgun, and several magazines of ammunition. Police say he entered the mall and immediately went into the food court bathroom where he stayed for an hour. His cell phone was later found in a toilet in that bathroom. The accused left the bathroom and began shooting, creating a scene of chaos. Police say he fired 24 rounds into the food court area. Officials say the gunman shot and killed Pedro Pineda, his wife, Rosa Miran Rivera de Pineda, and 30-year-old Victor Gomez. He also wounded a woman and a child. An armed bystander, Elijah Dickin, shot at the gunman, firing 10 rounds, killing him. Greenwood's police chief called Dickin's actions nothing short of heroic saying many people would have died if not for a responsible armed citizen that took action very quickly. Local officials spoke at a press conference Monday thanking Dickin. I grieve for these senseless killings and I ache for the scars that are left behind on the victims and on our community. We're very thankful for a young 22-year-old man who stopped this violent act. This young man Greenwood's good, good Samaritan acted within seconds, stopping the shooter and saving countless lives. Our city, our community, and our state is grateful for his heroism in this situation. Joe, Elijah Dickin, absolute hero. No questions asked. No one's going to debate that. But in this shooting comes the narrative that a good guy with a gun can stop a bad guy with a gun. How does that fit into this story where three people, where three victims were killed and two injured. Yeah, that's the problem. We focus on the fact that uh, Mr. Dickens did what he did, and we're all glad that he did so. And so he saved other lives. But the work is in having the discussion about what we can do to avoid the three from potentially having to die in similar circumstances. This culture of weaponry, this 
easy access, uh, easy acquisition of guns, et cetera. Um, sure, there are certain parties that have become a narrative, a political narrative, frankly, that this is the way to go. Uh, but for every such case, there are also other cases where someone mistakenly uh, gets shot who was not the bad guy. And so how do you know which is which? It could have been confusing. They were lucky. Um, and um, But there's more work to be done. Yeah. And let me be clear, I do not blame Dickens for those who are dead or injured. I think he did everything he can. But the question is, how do we prevent one death or one injury? Terry, what are we learning about this shooter? And are we seeing patterns with him and any other mass shooters? You know, there are so many patterns here. We saw that this shooter was well prepared. He had an automatic rifle. He had a pistol. He had 100 rounds of ammunition. And we saw that there was no previous violence with this individual. That's been the same in many of these cases. He was recently evicted, and he did quit his job. So perhaps he did have some mental issues before the shooting. All right, well, Joe, Terry, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.